30 years ago, on a Tuesday, on the 17th of August 1982, Ruth Heloise first was killed by a letter bomb in her office at the Center of African Studies at Eduardo Mondlane University of Maputo. There she was collaborating with a team of Marxist academics to assist the Frelimo government of the recently liberated Mozambique to fashion a new social order. Like her 13 Umkonte were seized with compatriots who were murdered by the apartheid army a year earlier at the Matola massacre, every activist knew that the mad securocrats of Pretoria had assassinated Ruth First. Our gut feeling was well versed, and we did not have to wait for validation. As day will follow night, 15 years later, apartheid state agent Gary Raven and Craig Williamson went groveling to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and made the predictable confession of the unspeakable slaying of Ruth First. Both were granted amnesty and together with their principles escaped their feet being held to the fire for the dastardly deed that robbed our country of a lead and revolutionary of immeasurable pedigree. Her life is well recorded and needs no further purging. She was born into a family of radical socialists, Tilly and Julius First, who helped form the Communist Party of South Africa in the 1920s already. Like many Johannesburg girls of her time, she went to Jeppe High School for girls and later attended this very university where she was very active in non-racial student politics. In no time after graduation, Ruth turned to journalism, becoming editor of the left-wing newspaper, The Guardian, and later, The New Age. These newspapers changed their names regularly over the next decades, as in the 1950s, the minority state acted against and banned the Communist Party and censored progressive media. Ruth Fest wrote profusely, despite the adverse and repressive setting. Her investigative journalism laid bare the harsh conditions under which majority of South Africans lived. Her courageous writing exposed the evils of post-colonial apartheid and its deleterious burden on lives of black South Africans. Being an inveterate socialist, she spared no moment to expose the racialized capitalism and to bring into sharp focus the contradictions between labor and capital and the exploitative role assumed by the state in that struggle. She authored some of the finest social and labor journalism, well animated by her Marxist disposition and wide internationalism. When I was barely seven years of age in the 1950s and had just 10 started reading newspapers, indeed to assuage my school master father, who insisted that I read anything and everything in sight. I remember reading the serial articles Ruth wrote in the New Age on the exploitation of prison labor by Bethel potato farmers. People detained under past laws were channeled to potato farms where they lived in virtual slavery and had to harvest potatoes out of the ground with their bare and festering fingers. Ruth's journalistic expose of this human horror jolted many middle-class whites out of their racist apathy and triggered the potato boycott of the mid-90s called by the African National Congress on the heels of the defiance campaign of 1952. As we all know, Ruth married Joe Slover, a fellow communist and activist and advocate of the Johannesburg Bar. Together they lived the played a leading role in the ever more militant protests of the 1950s. In 1953, both Ruth and Joe helped found the South African Congress of Democrats, a close ally of the African National Congress, in resisting repression and economic exploitation. She had more than a passing connection with the Freedom Charter, as she served on the drafting committee but as she was banned, she missed its adoption at the Congress of the People in Cliptown in 1955 on the 25th of June. 
In December, Ruth, 56, Ruth and her husband were arrested and charged with high treason. And with 154 other leaders of the Congress movement, all of the accused were acquitted after a treason trial that lasted a little over four years. From 1960, following on the state of emergency, declared after the Sharpeville shooting, Ruth first was banned and later arrested several times, including being detained in solitary confinement for 90 days, during one of which she contemplated suicide. In March 1994, she left South Africa with her children on exit permit to join her husband in, in London. And from there became intensely involved in anti-apartheid politics. In the 70s, she resumed writing, authored several books, pamphlets, and articles on Africa. And in particular, on the destabilizing role South Africa was playing in the region. She also taught developmental sociology at Dareham University in England, a role which stood her in good stead during her later stay in Mozambique. <coughs> Ruth first had a towering intellect, and it is said that she did not suffer fools gladly. She rejected racism outright and sneered at patriarchy. She hunkered for a non-racial, non-sexist society, and her whole life bore testimony to these fundamental beliefs. Many of her writings were landmark in Marxist academic debate. She was sharply critical when the occasion called for it. Some observed that she was impatient with bluster, something which earned her enemies in political debate. But she was not dogmatic. Her willingness to take up a position she considered to be just was not always welcomed by her comrades in party circles. In 1977, she returned to Africa, where she became professor and research director at the Center of African Studies in Maputo, Mozambique. The apartheid regime considered her nearness to our borders sufficiently ominous to cut short her life by a deadly letter bomb. As I depart from this brief description of the life of Ruth First, it is appropriate that I recall the tribute paid to her by that worker general, Umsebenzi, in the South African Communist Party, who properly hailed her, and I quote, as another martyr in this long struggle for liberation. The tribute continued. Her death had been fashioned in the hearts of those who had long realized that she was a tireless and committed fighter and revolutionary, a writer of consummate skill, gifted with rare incisive vision, which combined her craft and energy to actively combat the unspeakable evil of the South African system. My personal tribute to Ruth First is best cast in what Herigwala, another matter of a heroic struggle, taught to young carders and political prisoners on Robben Island. That included the President of the Republic and me. I was one of those who sat at the feet of this self-proclaimed Stalinist and master of the revolution. I don't recall who he attributed the code to, but this revolutionary mantra stayed with me. I've expunged the word man for woman. A woman's greatest possession is life since it be given to her to live but once, she must so live it that in dying she must be able to say, all my life and all my strength have been dedicated to the finest cause in the world, and that is the liberation of mankind. Enough said about the revolution and its poetry. Agonizing question I've chosen to ask is in what way this heroic life of Ruth First should inspire my role as a judge in a post-conflict society, thus in a transforming society and in one in transition. I propose to explore this question within an overarching theme of courage of principle. It seems to me that people who are bent on changing their world 
require courage of principle. Courage of principle implies three fundamental and interconnected patterns of behavior. The one is a vision. The other entails concrete steps to pursue and realize the vision. And the third is the preparedness to pay the price for a rigorous pursuit of that vision. For one thing, the primal starting point of individual or collective change, as I've said, must be a vision. A vision must be formulated and articulated. It is that eternally coherent statement of principles that imagines idealized or desirable social, political, or cultural outcomes. In the context of a political or revolutionary movement, a vision may consist only of minimum demands, which may rise to the level of an ideology, suitably supplemented by strategy and tactics. At different times in our long struggle, we have seen the movement of the people stake the claim for freedom, for equality, and for democracy. One of the earliest articulations of these values occurred in the 1912 with the formation of the African National Congress. And thereafter, the values were consistently followed in a variety of charters, such as the Atlantic Charter, the Freedom Charter, the 10-point program of the, of the Unity Movement, the Africanist Manifesto, and the Socialist Humanism of the Black Consciousness Movement. Thus, a vision is that lone star that lights the way to a just society. We have seen how Ruth first was consumed until her demise by the high notions of a non-racial, non-sexist, and equal society. Her entire activism sought to banish underdevelopment. She hated an even spread of means of production and distribution, and the resultant human indignity to the working people and the poor, both at home and in the rest of the world. For me as a judge, that most, the most recent and coherent articulation of our collective convictions arising from our revolution must be the high principles of our constitution. I'm not debating whether the constitution is perfect or whether it's sufficiently a sufficiently progressive bargain or whether it provides for the best social order we deserve given our history and our troubled past. That debate is both helpful and perhaps necessary, provided we remind ourselves our collective vision has in fact been settled by the democratic principle. The unanimous representatives of the people installed it as our first law and joined ideal of a just society. Of course, the people through our representative may change it. They have indeed done so at least 15 times since 1994. And many, the Constitution is a prerogative of the people who installed it, provided the requisite majority is present and the formalities of the Constitution are followed. In the same vein, when Parliament enacts a law that is consistent with the Constitution, as a judge, I am duty-bound to give effect to it. Thus, our vision of a just society is a dynamic one, open to constant but only necessary revision. It is subservient to the democratic ethos, provided it takes the form of valid laws and valid executive policy. Our constitution never was and is not cast in stone, and yet it should never, never be changed, only to pander to narrow sectarian interests. It seems to me as a judge, I must hold dear and cherish the collective vision of our people who I'm required to serve. I must know and understand the high principles that animate that vision. Even more importantly, I must commit without reservation to help migrate our society from its dim past to a just social order. And therefore, fidelity to the Constitution the supreme law and other laws of our country is simply indispensable. As a judge, I owe a duty to the rest of our people to police its compliance. 
This I should do recalling the long and historic struggles against past social injustices with a full recognition of his historic mission to afford a better life for all. In other words, it behoves me and us to remember how we came where we are and what animates the democratic project in the pursuit of a just society. We cannot dip in society, democracy and realize social justice without certain bare minimums. Put bluntly, we cannot defeat the triple burden of unemployment, poverty and disease without these minimums. We sorely need the rule of law and not mob rule. All public power must be sourced in law, not in personal predilections or group preferences. The exercise of public power, and indeed of private power, where it serves the same purpose as public power, must be rational. By that I simply mean that it must pursue some public good, some legitimate government purpose, in other words, public power, including fiscal and budgetary competences, may not be deployed to pursue ulterior or other expedient purposes. For instance, appointments in the public space must be done in accordance with the law, rationally, lawfully, and not in pursuit of mere hegemony or patronage. The people so appointed, objectively speaking, ought to be sufficiently competent to pursue the public task they are entrusted with. This is a common sense utilitarian requirement if public officials are incompetent to give effect to their public duties, are incapable of effective and honest use of public resources, our vision of a good society would come to naught. Our transition would abort. We cannot compromise on competence and certainly not on integrity of those who, who ought to help society to move to a better space. The Constitution enjoins us to observe good governance with an effective state. It insists that the best of government and indeed of all organs of state must be transparent, must be accountable and must be responsive. These values cannot now dissipate under the madness of incumbency. These stringent requirements apply equally to judges. All law binds me to. In my personal and judicial life, I may not act unlawfully or inimical to the vision of our people as encrusted in law and in valid policy. Besides being impartial, I must be efficient, diligent, and effective as I perform my judicial function in an open court. The principles of open justice requires nothing less. It behoves me to be transparent, to be accountable, and to be responsive. I must explain and lay bare my reasoning for any decision I reach, for all to assess, to criticize, or indeed, perhaps, to support. It is welcome that public debate ensues on the merits of the reasoning and outcome of my judgments. And yet it is singularly unhelpful to suggest that because one differs with the judgment or outcome, the judge concerned is serving some ulterior purpose or is pursuing the agenda of some one or the other party. Judges are accountable to all people and to no political party and to no ideological tendency. I'm proud to say that virtually all my judicial sisters and brothers take seriously this obligation and live by it. In some instances, judges get the facts or even the law wrong. That tells us nothing about their judicial probity. Our democratic system, like most in the world, readily ag acknowledges judicial fallibility and arrests that risk by creating a hierarchy of courts with appellate responsibility. A few jurisdictions on our African continent increasingly dishonored this requirement of open and accountable judicial function to their utter detriment. 
judges stop explaining themselves publicly. Arbitrariness and judicial dishonesty took root. Recently, we received at the Constitutional Court a Judicial Commission delegation from our sister country, Kenya, which related how their judiciary faltered, so much as to make it necessary to ask all judges to resign in the interest of a fresh start. The delegation sought our counsel and judicial experience thus far. Our esteemed retired colleague, Albisek, serves on a panel assisting Kenya to select fresh judges in accordance with a new constitution. For us, the lesson is fundamental to be drawn from the Kenyan experience. And it must be that we must give all our all to protect the integrity and effectiveness of our institutions of democracy, including the judiciary, a narrow and sectarian interest to make any public institutions compliant or pliable, ultimately redounds the disadvantage of all our people. Properly, these institutions have to survive intergenerational and party political changes as we continue to pursue our collective good. I have suggested earlier that beyond the vision, concrete and credible steps are required to make the vision real. That much is true too of judicial function. Courage of principle requires judges to do what they have to do. Much like other social activists who are expected to take practical steps to realize the vision, judges too must show absolute fidelity to the law. Judicial power flows from the Constitution and nowhere else. Ours in particular vests in judges wide and vast decision-making powers. It is no exaggeration to state that the people have installed the judiciary as the ultimate guardians of our Constitution. In this sense, the judiciary therefore, in my view, is an integral part of the transition and the achievement of a variety of social and economic goods our Constitution promises. It is barest, therefore, to say a few things about the judicial function, is not anything more than an instrument to prosecute and advance to these cherished values. Its primary duty is to ensure that laws, and hopefully just laws, that flow from our Constitution, devised to uphold our common convictions, are honored. In that sense, the rule of law is no more than a fetish of lawyers. It's an integral part of the democratic process. Laws are made by people through their democratic representatives. In their purest form, they are meant to represent the anxieties and hopes of the people. They are meant to nest and address the deep, deepest fears of our society. On that view, judges play therefore a vital agency role. Their role is utilitarian. That explains why contextual adjudication is so vital in modern jurisprudence. We have to debunk the mystery around judicial function. By implication, therefore, judicial function is always, we are always invited to mediate conflict. We are required to enforce standards that we have imposed upon ourselves in pursuit of the collective vision. This implies that we must be embedded in the crucial struggles of the people we serve. We must be alive to the history and the social context and the contradictions of the society we live in. No ivory towers are any longer permitted. And when all public and private functionaries are performing at the height of their sincerity with appropriate competences, judges must refuse to trespass into those terrains. They must stand by, they must cheer, they must applaud as society flourishes. It is well known that our role must be performed within the strict observance of division of powers. It must be said that Parliament must be in the forefront of making laws and making budgetary allocations to help change our divided and unequal past. The executive is entrusted with vital roles of policy formulation, management of the budget, and key executive functions. It is therefore self-evident that courts are relevant only in the event 
of a system failure. Our role is not proactive, but reactive. It arises only when a breach of a vital right or an interest is alleged, and only when other forms of mediation have failed. We don't choose cases, they choose us. We have neither the purse nor the sword, and yet we are entrusted with vital policing duties. This scheme that apportions public power is foundational to a democratic project. Courts must bolster rather than diminish democratic control. They must be wary not to intrude into the terrain of the legislature, the executive, and other state institutions. This they must do only in the clearest of cases and only when the Constitution permits the intrusion. That, however, does not import wholesale deference to other state actors. Our Constitution, I've said a few times, is pro-poor. It is cognizant of the, vulnerability in, in, the vulnerable in society. It is promised on a past that has, been entrenched, that has entrenched vacuous, but real divisions along race, gender, class, religion, and add a few other prejudices. Like Ruth first, our Constitution seeks to achieve a caring, sharing, and empathetic society. It rejects the notion of a mere, mere political might being right and seeks to restrain and control all public power and private power within the constraints and overarching basic law. In many senses, our courts up to now have been remarkable. Shortly after our transition, equality and discrimination cases proliferated. In a series of notable cases, courts have refused to tolerate inequality and discrimination. They've struck down scores of laws that undermine appropriate respect for diversity or that harbor antiquated prejudices. Amidst many rumblings, courts would not tolerate, for example, homophobia, gender inequality inspired by religious or cultural patriarchy. They fashioned the notion of substantive equality that travels well beyond the literal notion of liberal formal equality. We have insisted that laws and policy must provide adequate protection for children, root out domestic violence, and people with disability, as well as refugees and migrants. Courts of time without count require the executive to give effect to socioeconomic claims of the poor and the vulnerable. We have required the government to provide appropriate access to health care. Happily so today, our jurisdiction is arguably one of the best public regimes of HIV AIDS patients. We have, remained, we have reminded the executive of that duty to provide access to housing. Courts have been slow to evict homeless people. And we have insisted that the government must find alternative accommodation should eviction ensue. We have insisted that drinkable water be made available to vulnerable members of society. We have protected learners from being subjected to medium of instructions they don't choose. We have required that learners be furnished with study material, a recent example. We have mediated differences around rampant eviction of the homeless, urban and rural occupiers who are said to be unlawful. Courts have required social grants to reach all, including migrants, and that they are paid promptly, particularly in rural neighborhoods. Our courts have developed a proud jurisdiction on justice at the workplace. That is a consequence of vital choices our founding mothers and fathers have made on worker rights, recognition and formation of trade unions and employer organizations, the resultant collective bargaining and fair labor practices. Properly so, courts have refused to sacrifice workplace justice on the back of claims or promises of economic growth that a so-called open labor market will bring to us. There is a matter on which judges are not at large to free will. Just labor laws are integral to a more equal and just society and, and dignity of all, including working people who should be well shielded. We have been properly preoccupied with the right to free expression 
including a free press and the right to impart and to receive information and the arts. Our judgments point to intrinsic worth of free expression and the many public and private blessings of a free and open and debating society. And yet our judgments have also warned that free expression has limits, particularly when it encroaches on dignity and privacy. However, when public interest is an issue, other and perhaps more pressing considerations may very well come to the fore. The balance is not generic. It can only be properly stuck, struck on a case-by-case -case basis. In all of this, sadly, my personal sadness, we've had very few cases on land restitution or on state expropriation of land or on its acquisition for public use. One would have expected that a matter so pressing as land use, occupation and ownership would predominate the list of disputes of the dawn of our democracy. It may be that the property and restitutionary provisions of section 25 of the Constitution on land have been underworked and underutilized. Courts have intervened where valid allegations have been made about wrongful procurements of goods and services by government. This is a sequel to the solitary, salutary requirement to our constitution that when all spheres of state contract for goods and services, they must do so within a system that is fair, equitable, transparent, competitive, and cost-effective. To that end, Parliament is enjoined to legislate in order to prescribe an appropriate framework of a procurement policy. Do we have it? I don't know. Of course the Constitution was alive to the fact that our government would serve as a vital cork in the achievement of a more equal society. And it is thus anxious to ensure that public procurement helps erode past underdevelopment and social inequality. In the same breath, however, the same Constitution is truly and properly inimical and intolerant to public or private corruption. Courts can only deal with prosecutions that come before them. And these may be fewer than what they should be. Where the prosecuting authorities have ventured into courts, the record shows that my judicial sisters and brothers have not blinked nor wavered. Competition law has found a niche in our courts. This is admirable. In the past, the economy was per has permitted very little real competition in the market because of structural and behavioral anti-competitiveness. Some of our manufacturing and retail businesses have been found by our courts to have engaged in collusive practices, including price fixing. The Competition Commission and its tribunals have done much enviable to remedy or reduce commercial injustice to consumers, often vulnerable people, that flow from collusive pricing. Well, do I have regrets about judicial function in the last 18 years? The answer must be yes. Judicial function, as I've said earlier, can only be reactive and is often limited to specific cases and their particular set of facts. It is true that precedents such as those I have just cited to you do add to what's the achievement of a better life for all. And yet, judicial precedent often has a minute impact in comparison to the tools of social transformation placed in the hands of the legislature and the executive, as well as civil society. Judges are not much more than referees. They hope to keep the players on the straight and narrow for there to be a fair and worthwhile match. Thus, my regrets stem from the continued chasm between our collective promise to, to, our, to, to ourselves and the reality of the majority of our people. About that, judges can do much more. 
We must keep the faith, though. We must try to keep the state actors to practice the faith. We must ensure compliance with the promises in the hope that it will accrue to the benefit of all of us and the most vulnerable of us. Perhaps the second and biggest sadness I bear is the low level of access to courts by vast numbers of citizens who might be aggrieved. Access to courts and therefore to justice has an obvious gender class and race dimension. That is singularly true when one has to litigate up to the apex courts like the Supreme Court of Appeals and our, our very court, the Constitutional Court. This is not only true of the poor people but also of middle income people. Access to justice has become unaffordable. In this context, much of our jurisprudence flows from the innovative and caring intervention of public interest entities, from organs of civil society and NGOs. We owe these activists a debt of gratitude. They've taken on many trend-setting cases that have brought respite to the poor, the vulnerable, and indeed to our jurisprudence. Otherwise, our jurisprudence would have been skewed in favor of powerful commercial interests in a society already deeply divided and unequal. The Legal Aid Board does a splendid job of increasing access to courts, I must add, however much innovation and resources have to be devised urgently to make justice more accessible. On this score alone, Ruth Fest would have wondered what her and our struggle was all about. That, then that brings me to my third judicial sadness. One of my conventional obligations as a judge is to make prison visits. I would want to do that, being he who grew up in a prison. Ruth First would have wanted to do that, have been arrested and detained so long and so often. Like me, she would not have been amused. Our prisons are full, very full, of young men and young women well beyond the initial occupancy levels of those prisons. Recently, my walkabout in one of our largest prisons in Gauteng revealed frightening overcrowding of awaiting trial prisoners. Three to four people seemed to share a bed meant for one. The authorities suggested to me that the average time to await a final trial is, date is approximately two years. And yet the intake of additional people awaiting trial occurs daily. Whilst the department responsible for correctional centers may be doing its best in trying circumstances, courts must, must devise in collaboration with other institutions concerned with criminal justice, effective caseload management, particularly in criminal courts, that will honor, not in the breach, the constitutional guarantee to a fair and speedy trial. It is not in opposite, therefore, at this point, for judges to remind themselves, and indeed all of us, that while the legislature is the will of the majority, courts must always remain the conscience of society. I've come to the end of what I sought to tell you. What remains is to say a few things about willingness to bear the consequences of courage. I suggested at the beginning that the inevitable consequences of courage and principle must be a willingness to bear the consequences. Ruth first paid that ultimate price. In extreme repression, those entrusted with power soon forget and resort to death torture and exclusion to prop up their hegemony. 
We are a proud democracy. In many respects, we have established Admar an admirable state, a proud nation, and several institutions of excellence. We have picked much of the low-lying fruit. Only now the hard work should begin. In some respects, our courts are one such, I want to suggest, potential center of excellence. However, judges, and certainly all of us, cannot now back off from our bounden duty to educate and train the young, to transmit to them the very best values of our long and heroic struggle. We must keep our collective vision well in sight. We must garner the courage and the comfort to speak out and to act on it. We must require our public functionaries to pursue in truth a better life for all. The price we are to pay for our social activism is small indeed. Nothing, just about nothing comparable to Ruth Fest's supreme price. We must be truthful and rigorous in the pursuit of a more equal and just society. We must have the courage to call it right, even in the most difficult circumstances. That is so because our collective vision is not open to debate. Its primacy is well settled by a long line of a very virtuous struggle. Thank you for listening and God bless.